So I'm Paul Jarrett. I'm a dermatologist working at Middlemore, and I've been given the grand task of 15 minutes to do an itchy rash in the elderly, which is absolutely impossible. So what I've decided to do is pick various aspects of itchy rashes in the elderly. So I have no conflicts. And just to warn you that some sensitive photos are going to be used. And of course, as ever, grateful to Dermnet as a great source of dermatology information and photos. So this is an algorithm I'm going to take you through. And we'll, each of the yellow boxes are a diagnosis. This is a, uh, the first case. Now, an itchy rash in the elderly implies that the primary reason they're itching is a rash. But in some elderly patients, they have pruritus, which means that their skin is completely normal, but they itch, uh, something is driving the itch. And in this person, they've caused the rash because they are itchy. And if you look at the back here, this is an area where the person cannot reach. So they created this rash by excoriating them. So pruritus without a rash is an important diagnosis. And I've just been helping a colleague down in Christchurch and an elderly patient presented with pruritus. And we did a pruritus screen. They were found to be iron deficient. And subsequently, their doctor investigated them and found them to have a, a malignancy, a bowel malignancy. So in these patients who are elderly, a systemic inquiry is very helpful. S lymphoma, leukemia, lung, breast, gastric. So a helpful um, first screen in an elderly patient who is itchy but without a primary rash is to do a pruritus screen. Full blood count, see if their renal function is off. Renal failure is a good cause of itch. Abnormal LFTs cause itch. Hypo and hyperthyroidism cause itch. Iron deficiency is a common cause, actually in younger people as well. And the skin autoantibodies, which we'll talk about. And generally, I don't do imaging unless they have a good background, for example, as a, a smoker, where you might want to pick up a lung cancer. So the first point is that malignancy can cause itch in the elderly. So now we'll go around the algorithm. So generalized itch lifelong. And it's important not to forget that a significant proportion of children carry their atopy into adulthood and into old age. And last year at Middlemore, very sadly, an elderly patient voiced suicidal ideation to me about a lifelong history of severe atopic eczema. There are very good treatments coming for it, but we, they're not funded yet. So an important message is that I always assumed emollients were completely harmless, but this is a screen grab from the UK. And emollients that contain a large amount of paraffin can act as accelerants and cause the person to die. And it's a, you know, if you're looking after an old patient who might be a cigarette smoker with an eczema for any cause, the paraffin-based emollients soak into their skin and they sit back at night, have a cigarette, fall asleep, and that acts as an accelerant. And there have been deaths in the UK associated with that. And of course, if they have home oxygen and they're smokers, then it's just not worth thinking about. And our MedSafe have caught up on this. So uh, emollients that are at risk will be labelled as fire risks. So emulsifying ointment is a good one, for example. And the other thing to remember in the elderly using emollients is if they're in the bath, and they're covered in an emollient, it's very easy to slip and break a neck of femur. So be careful in the use of them. Generalized recent onset. So astyototic eczema, it is normal with age for the skin to dry out. And if you feel the skin of elderly patients, it's often dry. And astyototic eczema is a consequence of the dryness and the typical clinical picture is this crazy paving appearance. If you look at this picture from Dermnet, you can see the eczema crackly or the crazy paving appearance of it. It's very distinctive. It's actually very common in the 
legs of elderly people because sun damage will augment that problem. So eczema, crackle. So take care with emollients. There's a fire risk and you'll be able to identify those patients who are at risk and careful with slipping as well. So generalised recent onset. Scabies. I love this. I love this diagnosis. It is very, very difficult to uh, diagnose sometimes. And if I'm honest with you, I have missed it. I've looked for it, but missed it. And I'm going to harp on a little bit about this. And if you think it's scabies, and you've treated them for scabies, and it's still itchy, it probably still is scabies, actually. <laughs> So my, um, I have a number of 101 rules, and one is that every rest home resident has scabies if they're itchy until proved otherwise. It's served me well over many years. And an interesting thing is that I've seen elderly people, I've been to rest homes, and the index case is a person with severe cognitive impairment. And because they're cognitive impaired, they don't know to itch. So people recognise they have a rash, but they're not itchy, and forget they might have scabies. So cognitive impairment alters the itch sensation and behaviour. And if you push for time in a busy clinic, it's very rewarding to look at the hands and the wrists, because very, very commonly, you'll find scabies mites around there. And remember that the average mite burden is 10, so that the rash that people get from scabies is an allergic reaction to the poo and scabies protein. So you have to really go on a scabies hunt. It's quite exciting sometimes, <laughs> but look around the wrists. And interestingly, I've um, again been helping Christchurch, and somebody, uh, an e-referral came through of somebody who is itchy, we've treated for scabies, we've given them ivermectin, they're itchy, and the picture came through very similar to this. And if you look at this person's hand here, there are scabies mites here, probably here as well, and they're taking a beautiful dermatoscopic image of a scabies mite and sent it without actually recognising it was scabies, so I'll show you one. So that's a close-up, and here, that little black dot at the end of the barrow, which is so small, you can barely see it, is the mite, and they burrow in the stratum corneum, and they leave this scale trail behind. And if you put a dermatoscope on them, it's a very helpful sign. I've done it blindly on occasions, because if they put cream on their skin, the burrow will be emoliated, so you won't see it. So this, uh, there's a number of names for this sign. I quite like um, the Vulcan bomber sign that used to fly over school when I was in the UK. And if you squash a mite, it looks like an arrowhead or a Vulcan bomber or a stealth fighter, actually. And it's a good way to find them. So scabies. So in the elderly and in the young people, it's important to treat the face as well as the rest of the body. Treatment failure is a common reason for scabies not to get better. And there's nothing finer at Middlemore than finding a scabies mite burrowing across somebody's forehead. I mean, I don't know why it would know it shouldn't be on the forehead, but they're there, so include the face. And then treat the whole community at one time. And ivermectin is very useful for rest home outbreaks. But remember that ivermectin and permethrin, when permethrin is used correctly, they're equally as efficacious. There's no advantage of one over the other. And ivermectin does potentially have a number of drug-drug interactions. But in the elderly, and in the rest homes particularly, it's very difficult to accurately and carefully apply permethrin from the face all the way down, because they're in bed, they're closed, they may have dressings on sores. So I, I think ivermectin's a good option for uh, rest home outbreaks, and the elderly infirm, who you're just not going to get cream everywhere. So try not to, it's easily done. So generalised recent onset. Now drug eruptions are common in elderly patients and one to remember is vildagliptin. And vildagliptin has been funded as a diabetes treatment only in the last four or five years. And there's a substantial body of literature 
around vildagliptin inducing bullous pemphigoid, which is an autoimmune blistering disorder. And bullous pemphigoid can present with itch and a rash before the blisters actually turn up. So if you're suspicious of it, a skin biopsy is very helpful and you can do a blood test to measure the skin autoantibodies. So the key is to stop the vildagliptin. Use a potent steroid like Dermol if it's just localised. In the elderly, there's a very good study showing doxycycline, 200 milligrams once daily, is equally as good as prednisone because you try and avoid prednisone in the elderly, but often you need to use it um, to get under control. So uh, another tip is that it, bullous pemphigoid itself can present as an itchy rash for years sometimes prior to the blisters occurring. And the interesting thing about vildagliptin-induced bullous pemphigoid is that they can be on it for months and months and months and sometimes years, and then they get bullous pemphigoid, unlike other drug eruptions that often come within two weeks of starting the drug. So localised bilateral lower legs, stasis eczema. So in Middlemore, this is a very common presentation and it's mistaken for cellulitis. So it's key to remember that cellulitis and stasis eczema are different. As the edema increases in the elderly through stasis or heart failure, the stretching of the skin causes inflammation. So try and differentiate it from cellulitis. Stasis eczema is usually bilateral. They're usually afebrile. It's itchy rather than painful. And the treatment, compression alone, there are good studies that show compression is anti-inflammatory, provided their Dopplers will cope with it, their arteries are sufficient. Um, reverse the cause, so if they've got heart failure or they're static, try and make them more mobile. Always think about tinea, tinea can coexist, and if you put a steroid on this and there's tinea there, the tinea will go rampant and a potent steroid. So on this person's leg, you'd be comfortably using betamethasone, valerate or clobetazole for two to four weeks. So try and differentiate stasis eczema from primary cellulitis. Localised lichen simplex chronicus. So the elderly itch and scratch, and if you scratch one area of the skin repeatedly, it becomes thickened. And this is an example on the lower leg. So in these patients, you need to go hard with the topical steroids. Again, exclude tinea, that's always worth thinking about. It's another 101 Jarrett rule. But in this person's leg, you can comfortably put on an ultra-potent steroid for two to four to six weeks. And a an useful tip is to wrap the leg in glad wrap because that hydrates the epidermis and forces the steroid in and it's more effective. And if you're a little uncertain, about the efficacy or not, bring them back in a week or two or check them to see how it's going. Atrophy is very unlikely in this case. So go long and strong with topical steroids for lichen simplex chronicus. This is something that's often not recognised. Localised, usually female, it's on the genital skin, which is lichen sclerosis. So this is a disorder that elderly people, and particularly elderly women, will not volunteer that they're itchy down below. And it is intensely itchy. And it's a very important diagnosis to make because it's treatable, it's not curable. And if you look at the picture here, you can see that there is loss of genital architecture. It causes fusion of the labia. There's whitening of the skin. And they itch and itch and itch. So the elderly person, you might have to ask them about this. And we did a study some years ago where we cruised through a couple of rest homes and we found a, a couple of elderly women who had never volunteered. They had itchiness down below. So the treatment is strong steroids. So dermal once daily, ointment sometimes comfortable for up to three months to reverse the itch. So go long and strong with this. And it's an important diagnosis to make because a number of women and men, but women who get it, about two or three percent of them will develop a vulval squamous cell carcinoma. 
So if you make the diagnosis, it's important just to monitor them yearly. So elderly women and men, do you get it, may not volunteer that they have genital itch. So that's it. We've gone through it all. And in summary, this is the paper that we wrote around it. And my top tips are, remember that malignancy can cause itch in the elderly. So they'll have pruritus without a rash. If they have a rash, it's probably because they're scratching themselves and the skin is excoriated. Take care with emollients because you don't want them to burn to death, it's happened, and you don't want them to slip in the bath. Try not to miss scabies, it's so easily done. And if you think it's scabies and you treat them for scabies and they're still itchy, it's still scabies until proven otherwise. <laughs> try not to, try not to, try to differentiate stasis from um, primary cellulitis. Go long and strong with lichen simplex chronicus and don't forget genital lichen, simplex, uh, genital, uh, lichen sclerosis. And that's me done, thank you.